to talk about the energy changes that are associated with chemical reaction. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put some potassium chlorate on this brick. So this potassium chlorate, KClO3. Remember the color of that flame. What color was that flame? Okay, so our title is Energy Changes in Chemical Reactions. And you've got to admit that that was a pretty spectacular flame that we saw out there. Um, and so uh, my question to you is, dude, would you want to put your hand in it? that brick while it was flaming up? You know, I don't think so. Because that chemical reaction that you just observed um, can be categorized as being an exothermic reaction. Meaning that heat is transferred. Transfer of heat is out during that chemical reaction. And that makes the surroundings feel warm, hot, to the point where Owie. It's going to hurt your hand. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, how we quantify the energy changes that occur in a chemical reaction. When we looked at the exothermic reaction of the methane combining with oxygen and combustion, we wrote a chemical reaction, a chemical equation, a balanced chemical equation to represent for us what was happening on the molecular level. Now what we're going to do, you guys, is uh, not only are there chemical equations that are associated with a reaction that show us what occurs at the molecular level, but we can also quantify the energy changes that occur. And so that is what this chapter is all about, talking about the changes in energy during a chemical reaction. All right, so heat, first of all, is the transfer of thermal energy between two bodies that are at different temperatures. So heat is a transfer of energy. To analyze energy changes in reactions, one must first define the system in which the reaction is taking place. And we will um, go over a little bit of vocabulary right now so that we are certain that we understand what I mean here. All right, so open system exchanges both mass and energy with the surroundings. So what you just saw out there, you guys, that was an open system. I did that on an open brick. And that means that any product that I formed 
that is a gas is just able to go out into the surroundings. But not only are my products that are gases allowed to go out into my surroundings, but energy is also transferred to my surroundings. Um, so all of the gas, the air around that reaction also got warm out there. Um, it wasn't localized to the brick. It wasn't just the brick that, um, you know, got warm. It was everything else around it. And so in general, what we can think of here is, let's say we're going to do a reaction and an open beaker. Okay, so open beaker here. Okay, we would say that this is an open system because all the gas product is allowed to just flow out. It's not kept in there. And if it's an exothermic reaction, if it's if releasing, if the thermal energy is transferring out, heat is transferring out to the surroundings, then that means that the beaker is going to get warm as well as the air that is surrounding it. Nothing is trapped inside. It's an open system. All right. A closed system, none of the mass is able to escape, but it still can exchange energy with the surroundings. So it's absorbing energy, it can do that from its whole surroundings, or if it's releasing energy, energy is being transferred out, um, it can do that with its surroundings. So how can we make this open system into a closed system? Huh. Right, we're going to put a lid on it. If we put a lid on it, then we're not going to have any mass escaping. No gases can escape. All the mass has to stay in here. But energy transfer can still occur. Because this is glass. And so it's, it will transfer. Now, uh, the other one is an isolated system that we're going to talk about here. Um, and it exchanges nothing with the surroundings. So you guys, how could I make this closed system into an isolated system? How, what could I do so that this isn't going to transfer any energy out or in here? Well, I could do this in an insulated container, right? Like styrofoam would be an isolated system. So capped styrofoam, and then we'd still have a little bit of energy transfer, but not a lot, nothing like this glass. Okay. So, hopefully we've got that down. Those three things, open, closed, and isolated system. Um, so if someone describes a, a problem to you, open, closed, isolated, you'll understand what they mean by those three terms. Okay, reactions can be classified as either endothermic or exothermic. Okay, so we're going back here to, um, probably to middle school, I would say. <clears throat> and what's the difference between the two? Well, they're both therm, right, meaning thermal energy. And you guys, we think of this so much as being heat, but it makes it really confusing, doesn't it? Heat is actually the transfer process of the thermal energy. Okay, um, so I'm going to use heat. Heat and thermal energy kind of synonymously. It's hard to get away from it. Okay, um, so endothermic. The, the thermal energy or the heat is flowing in. The thermal energy, the flow of the heat transfer is, the heat is going out. Exo, exit. So exothermic reactions transfers thermal energy to the surroundings, and those surroundings feel warm. And an endothermic reaction transfers thermal energy in from the surroundings, and so the surroundings feel cold. If we have an exothermic reaction going on in this beaker, okay, it is going to transfer.
transfer heat energy, thermal energy to the beaker, and the beaker is going to feel what? It's going to feel warm. Okay, the therms are exiting. The therms are exiting. Okay, in an endothermic reaction, what it's doing, you guys, is actually absorbing thermal energy from the beaker into the reaction, absorbing energy into the reaction. And um, in order for the reaction to go, that's got to happen. Well, it's a little simplistic. I'll get back to it in a minute. Um, and so what that's going to do, because the, because the reaction is absorbing energy from its surroundings, that's going to leave the beaker feeling what? It's going to leave the beaker feeling cold. Because the reaction is actually absorbing energy from the beaker. It's absorbing thermal energy from the beaker. Okay, so what, what's all this energy being absorbed for? What's it all being released for? What, why? Why do some reactions absorb energy and why do some reactions release energy? Well, it's because of this thing called enthalpy, which, well, it's a little, okay. So to quantify the heat flow associated with reactions, chemists use in this property of matter called enthalpy. And we abbreviate enthalpy as a capital H. Okay, now, because heat, and we're quantifying heat flow, we're quantifying the transfer of thermal energy. Um, because heat is actually a transfer process, okay, it's the transfer of thermal energy from one object to another, um, it is calculated based on change of heat, or delta H change in enthalpy, change in heat, delta change in heat, change in enthalpy. Okay, now, what the heck is this enthalpy? What is this property? I like to think of it kind of as a vibrational instability uh, of the atoms that yeah, is that weird? It is. But uh, vibrational instability, like that's the best phrase that I can come up with to um, kind of paint the picture of what this thing really is. Okay, so this instability, this enthalpy is different for all compounds. Different compounds have differing amounts of enthalpy based upon the results of how the bond between the atoms affects the stability of each of those atoms. Okay. Delta H. Enthalpy of reaction. I'm going to make a big list on the board. There's so many ways this thing is phrased. Enthalpy of reaction. Heat of reaction. Delta H. Change in enthalpy. Change in heat. Heat of reaction. Okay, they all mean delta H. And delta H is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. So enthalpy of products minus enthalpy of reactants gives us the overall change in heat or the enthalpy of reaction. Okay. Now, if a reaction is endothermic, its delta H is positive. So that would mean that the enthalpy of the products is greater 
than the enthalpy of the reactants. So we actually have products being made where the bonds the bonds of the products are weaker than the bonds of the reactants. The bonds of the products have a greater amount of enthalpy. A greater amount of enthalpy. They have a greater amount of vibrational instability than the bonds of the reactants that form them. So when the enthalpy of the products are greater than the enthalpy of the reactants, this number is going to come out to be positive. It's endothermic. So whenever bonds are broken in the reactants, energy is absorbed. It takes energy to break bonds. When bonds form, energy is always released. Now it depends upon the ratio, the enthalpies of the two, whether or not overall we're going to have this thing being positive or if this thing is going to be negative. Okay, so when bonds are broken, energy is absorbed. It takes energy to break a bond. And when bonds form, energy is always released. But if the amount of energy released isn't as much as the amount of energy that was absorbed to break reactive bonds in the first place, the thing is going to end up being endothermic. Exothermic, delta H is negative, um, meaning that this number, the enthalpy of the products, is going to be less than the enthalpy of the reactants. And what that tells us, you guys, is products actually have very, very strong bonds. They have smaller enthalpy. They have less vibrational instability than the bonds of the reactants. Okay. And in the world, nature is always going to more stability. More stability. The less enthalpy something has, the more stable longer the bonds. Okay. It's energy, so delta H is measured in joules, just like um, just like all energy was measured in physics. Okay. So our unit is joules because it's energy that we're measuring here. All right. So let's do a problem. I know you think these notes are never going to end, huh? So let's calculate the heat evolved when 266 grams of white phosphorus burns in air. And you guys, in this case, we are given the delta H. So we know the delta H for this reaction. Delta H change in heat is equal to negative 3,013 kilojoules. Um, so because delta H is negative, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? The reaction is exothermic. Um, products. That the products have stronger bonds in them than the reactants. Alright, so let's do this problem. Okay, so what is our reaction for P4? Alright, so we've got white phosphorus 
It is P4, um, and it's solid. And if it is um, burning in air, what is it combining with? It's combining with oxygen. And that is going to give us um, P4O10. And that's solid. And let's balance this thing with five. All right. And our delta H is equal to negative 3013 kJ. So what that means is that for every one mole of P4 combusted, we're going to get negative 3,013 kilojoules of energy from that. For every five moles of oxygen, we'll get that much. And for every one mole of P4O10 formed. Okay, so we can think of that delta H in numerous ways. All right, you guys, so we want to know if we've got 266 grams of P4, how much energy is going to be released from the reaction. So we start with, we've got 266 grams of P4. So this is telling us for every one mole. So what do I have to change grams to? I have to change it to moles. So 123.88 grams of P4 per mole of P4. And what my reaction tells me is that I get negative 3013 kJ for every one mole of P4. My moles of P4 cancel, and that will leave me the amount of energy associated with 266 grams of white phosphorus combusting. And that number turns out to be negative 6,470 kJ kilojoules. Okay. What about if we consume 17 grams of oxygen gas? How much heat is associated? How much heat is evolved? What is the, the amount of energy associated with 17 grams of oxygen being undergoing combustion in this particular reaction? Um, all right, so let's say we're going to start with 17.0 grams of O2. Okay, and the reaction tells me I get negative 3,013 kilojoules associated with five moles of oxygen. So I'm going to convert grams to moles, 32.0 grams of O2 per mole of O2. All right, and then according to my heat of reaction, I have negative 3,013 kilojoules associated with every five moles of O2. All right. I don't have it calculated. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. So that turns out to be negative 320. two significant figures. I really just need to leave it at that, don't I? KJ. Okay, so that's how much is heat associated with five, 17 grams, sorry, 17 grams of oxygen um, undergoing combustion in 
this particular reaction. Okay, the last thing I want to do is I want to write down all the phrases that we can use for delta H. And then we'll be done. Okay, so what are all the ways that we can say this just to confuse us? And have we talked about how we find delta H? No. In this problem, you guys, you're given the heat of reaction, and then you do the calculations from it. But for the rest of the chapter, what are we going to talk about? How do we find delta H? What are the different methods we use to find the heat of reaction? Okay, so delta H. Well, change in enthalpy. Change in heat. Heat of reaction. Enthalpy of reaction. They all mean the same thing. They all mean delta H. But you know what? And there's going to be another phrase here that I've left off my list. Change in heat, change in enthalpy, heat reaction. Mm, yeah, another one will come to me to add to our list, I'm sure. All right, you guys. That's it. We'll practice tomorrow.